This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning. I'm Corby Comer from The Atlantic, and what I'm very lucky to have is on the stage with me, Lori Garrett, who has been writing um, books that I've been reading for a very long time. They always scare me. Um, even when my spouse is in them, as uh, Lori was kindly just mentioning, uh, I have the honor of being married to somebody who was in a recent book. Um, but she was the first to sound the warning signs about HIV is a global epidemic. And Lori sees around the corner in a way a lot of the people at this conference do. And she was just, I, I can barely speak, I'm so frightened by the scenario she was just spinning outside, which you can see on a new video that she has on the Council of Foreign Relations site. And she has a cover story in Foreign Affairs, their magazine, as you all know, coming out in two weeks. So we will see that. And I'm going to ask you to spin some of those scenarios, and I hope that you've had a very pleasant and calm breakfast. And um, uh, But it had to do with printing and new viruses. We've all been reading about the new flu viruses and jumping from birds to humans, and they can jump from lab to humans. So tell us about the labs. Well, I know you've all been having bliss meters and stuff, and. I'm going to be in a whole other ball game here. Uh, probably most of you have heard about H5N1, the bird flu virus that emerged in 1997 and fortunately has not infected very many human beings yet, around 600 or so. Uh, but it has a 66% mortality in humans with, if they do get infected. So it is the single most lethal virus we have seen in circulation in human beings as a potentially transmissible virus. Fortunately, so far, it, its main target is birds. It has not adapted certain key genetic changes that would make it readily transmissible between human beings through the air, like a normal seasonal flu is. Um, and then just this year, another bird fly, flu virus, H7N9, emerged in China, and it has about a 44% mortality rate, and it has indeed circulated in humans. And it seems to have made a genetic change that the H5N1 has not made um, but that could make it, give it the capacity to spread between humans readily. So there's a new trend. There's two huge new trends in biology. One of them here, I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with, synthetic biology. Um, the second is something you're probably less familiar with, gain of function research, or GOF. What has happened is that a lot of virologists are now, in the name of public health, merging the two to perform experiments that give circulating viruses uh, capacities that they don't have in nature in order to see what if. So first a lab, uh, a Dutch lab, that was funded by the NIH, turned H5N1 into a virus that spread between ferrets through the air, ferrets as a surrogate for humans. Then a lab in Wisconsin basically turned out to do the same experiment. And just a few months ago, a Chinese veterinary lab transformed 127 viruses, made man-made flu, all H5N1. Five of those, they figured out how to turn them into ones that readily spread through the air between guinea pigs. Now, in theory, is this what if, in order to create more effective vaccines that can be developed much faster than the current track does, which is something I happen to be reading a lot about right now? Yeah. Or is it, is it theoretically to help us? Is it all for evil science? We are going to hold you hostage with the viruses in our labs. No, I don't, I don't think there's any evil here, but I think there's a lot of 
uh, bizarre, misplaced scientific intent. Um, because one of the things that came out of the H5N1 deliberate genetic manipulations was identification of three key genetic changes, each just nucleotide shifts, um, and saying this is the key to making it highly transmissible between human mammals at any rate. Um, then H7 and 9 emerged, and the scientists that had been playing with the first flu virus said, wow, they, this one has made those changes, so let's all prepare for the great pandemic. And it didn't happen. So th in fact, the information did not lead us to a logical conclusion that could either result in massive vaccine manufacture, which of course, in the case of flu, is always a problem. Mm -hmm. We never have enough, ever, nor ever will we until we have a total you know, game change in what we're doing with flu vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, but it also meant that we went on alert over a genetic shift that did not, at least so far, turn out to result in pandemic strain. But getting back to Minneapolis and the Netherlands, is the idea that once they understand how this mechanism works, they can trace the progress of new emerging threats in China and Southeast Asia faster because they're aware of like, the exact steps where it becomes more transmissible. That's the humans. rationale, but it hasn't really worked out that way. Quite recently, we had the emergence of another virus called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coming out of Saudi Arabia, and we're all very, very nervous about it because the Hajj is coming up next week, and at that time, there will be a few million people pouring mm -hmm. into Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and part of the Hajj is to, you know, walk around. It's to breathe on each other. Yeah, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> and we're a little worried about it now. This is a virus that turns out probably to come from Egyptian tomb bats, which is very Bela Lugosi, actually. And, um, and it is very similar to the SARS virus, which some of you may recall emerged in China in 2003 um, and had, uh, w went global, was, a very serious outbreak. Um, we're worried about this, and um, right away, the Dutch group that had done the manipulation of the H5N1 virus said, you know what, we, we own the patent on, or we're gonna go for a patent, or we're gonna do something with intellectual property. It's not exactly clear, it's all very mushy, but our institution at Erasmus University uh, is saying that you can't have this virus to study it in anticipation of a possible pandemic without our permission. So part of the threat of these, this scarily fast progress of these labs develop, these, <coughs> developing extremely lethal viruses is, first, that they might escape the lab and be uncontrollable because really, how good is the protection? And second, that some of them will say, this is IP. You want to have research on emerging threats, you're not gonna get access to it. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the... Uh, absolutely, and then if you add to it what's going on in synthetic biology. And you know, when Craig Ventner in 2010 said, look, I've, I've made an artificial cell and I've made an artificial genome, I put it in the cell and it is replicating. I call that 4D printing. You know, he has essentially created something that self-replicates. Um, he put out warnings. He went to the White House, he went to uh, numerous institutions and said, this is a revolution. We are now going down another slippery slope. You guys need a regulatory system that knows how to watch this. You need an ethical framework. You can't put it all on me. He put the warnings out even before he had completed any of these experiments. And yet, the, the institutions that ought to have heeded those warnings, uh, first of all, don't even exist in most of the countries on the planet. And in the United States, where we do have some institutions that might have tried to come to grips with what this new era means for national security are really quite overwhelmed. And of course today, 70% of them are furloughed because their government's shut down. Right, so there's not gonna be much progress there. <clears throat> so that's one emerging threat. And before I'm gonna ask you to take us through some other emerging threats, because I was just reading on the CFR site a whole very, very alarming and very clear data-rich series of posts you wrote this spring on the Council for Foreign Relations site about other uh, emerging global threats we have to worry about. But you were mentioning 4D, this is 4D, and what was the 3D printing that you were talking about? Well, it was Craig Ventner who actually first suggested this, and now um, several drug companies are actively working on it for good reasons but it has some national security ramifications. And that is that um, it's now possible to design your own genomic sequence based on whatever 
you're plucking out of nature or you're popping your ATCGs around any way you wish. And to send that sequence to a 3D printer that is loaded with nucleotides. So you're, you're We on read about this, but it just doesn't seem true. You're, you're saying it's true. Some drug companies are already using the 3D printer mode to come up, to transmit necessary information for production of antigens for vaccines. Mm -hmm. So none of this is, is sci-fi, though it, there are some crucial steps that must be accomplished because it's sloppy. 3D printers are not hygienic, you know. A lot of very, just as the way the early days of gene sequencing, um, people had a lot of noise, a lot of sloppiness. People are learning how to clean that up. We're in the same position now with p the juncture between uh, biologicals and 3D printing. And then the next step would be, there's already the phrase in Silicon Valley, 4D printing. That refers to creating um, structures that then self-form. Once they've come out of the 3D printer, either with water added or just in the air, they, they then take on a conformation. Well, I would argue that in biology, that 4D printing is self-replication. That is uh, one thing to be thinking of in terms of scary little creatures emerging from our printers. Um, well, and it changes, it, from a national security point of view, the big shift now is that we've gone from um, a whole paradigm that was set up after 9-11 and anthrax, where we have a vast infrastructure designed to supposedly monitor for a top list of special pathogens, of scary things that we think bad guys could use. So it's everything from like Ebola to smallpox to anthrax, what have you. Um, but we're now in an era where that's a completely a waste of time and money because now it's about information. I can send a sequence to somebody's printer thousands of miles away and that sequence is the key to creating a dangerous organism. I hope there are some screenwriters in this audience. There's lots of ideas for plots that would... Well, you know, I, have you know, I worked on Contagion. I was one of Soderbergh's um, three advisors for that movie. I recall movie. that. And, and we did toss out some of these. <laughs> and we got, uh, I, I got for the Atlantic.com um, Tom Frieden to write a review of Contagion um, to talk about whether that was a plausible scenario. So other plausible scenarios, since as you can see, Laurie is very forward, far-seeing. I was very glad to read about uh, global climate change and its effect on health, which I think people still don't quite understand the direct correlation. Can you tell us something about it? Well, actually, you mentioned the articles that are, are posted on the CFR website that I recently did about what I call the five existential threats to global health. One of them, and oh, I would say overall, let me just kind of reflect on this meeting a second. I, I, I really like the way the conversations here um, and the conversations at UCSD and Scripps and so on are about kind of these bigger holistic views, the brain connected to whatever, the environment and all that. Um, and I think that global health has to move in that direction or as an entity, as a phenomenon, it will become obsolete and useless. It is very clear that human health is already being impacted by climate change and will be more in the future. It's very clear human health is impacted by food scarcity and the extraordinary inflation that occurs with widespread speculation in food commodity markets. And let us recall food scarcity is more a f political factor. More, much more. Po politics and distribution. It has a lot less climate. to do with whether or not there's food, there's soil than... than how food is distributed and who controls the distribution of food. Um, and there's, there's a whole range of issues such as w global economic structure that affect human health. But the global health movement has got itself into these silos. So you have a HIV movement and a TB movement and a you know, uh, child vaccination movement. And it's, there's no holistic approach even across the basic obvious trends that affect human health that we classically call health. Now you add to the book that as we've discussed here, the whole planet is aging. And as people age, every society is getting more cancer, more heart disease, more diabetes, more chronic health problems. And we don't have an architecture in global health that has a clue how to address those issues because all these are in these specific silos. Now you ask, can global health work with and be have continuity across struggles related to adaption 
adaptation, excuse me, to uh, climate change? Can global health work with the food uh, community, food security community in ways that are meaningful? Frankly, right now, there's no conversation. It's not meaningful. And one of the real problems in global health related to climate change is that um, everybody's going for a way to turn the climate change issue into financial advantage for their silo. So you have all these people out there saying, with that climate change... That seems so inhuman. I can't imagine that kind of behavior. So you have all these people out there saying there's going to be more malaria because of climate change, therefore give more money to anti-malaria efforts, or there's going to be more dengue, or there's going to be more this. The truth is climate change is not a uniform um, change in weather patterns or climate in, in, in the planet. You can't say the whole planet's going to be wetter. No, much of the planet will go into drought and is going into drought. Um, I feel that we're missing <coughs> the most crucial element of what's happening with climate change that affects human health directly, and that is the change in the, at the microbiome level. The susceptibility of bacterial species to s minute perturbations in surface temperature, acidity or salinity is absolutely devastating. We have whole sec sections of the planet at the microbiome level that can never be restored. They have permanently taken a new course. And this is intimately linked with climate change, yes? Absolutely linked to climate change and, of course, to pollution. Uh, and no one is taking that holistic view that we can think of now, right? Or are you working with other countries because you travel so widely? And have you seen more visionary countries or governments? <sighs> Well, there definitely are governments that are more visionary um, in various pieces of the puzzle, but we don't have a superstructure that is. So, for example, I, I think the Japanese government has to get a lot of credit for pushing health systems and health financing as a key element of how to get poor countries out of endless charitable dependency mode for health and into self-sustaining permanent structures of health in which there's dignity and there's self-empowerment. You also mentioned the challenges of an aging society, and they really are the global leaders. Absolutely, and they totally know it. And they're, they're quite conscious that even they, with a very well-managed national health system that mixes public and private sector, that they are going to be hard-pressed to pay their bill going forward as they have you know, the world's largest Nano, how do you say it? Nanogenarian? However you say it. Nanogenarian. <laughs> and centigenarians uh, on the planet. Um, I've seen, well, Norway, of course, stands out as the great donor on the planet. They don't give as much money in absolute terms, but on a per capita basis, the Norwegians are phenomenally generous and have taken global health issues very seriously. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're not going to be engaged in the climate side because why does Norway have money to give? Oil. Oil. Um, I, I, think we, I don't think we have a country we can point to and say these guys are doing it right. So going back to, I'm trying to think of some good news for the US health systems. Um, going back to H1N1 and H5 and H9N1, I thought I had these completely Sorry. straight. <laughs> no. Um, I thought that there was much better cooperation between China and the United States in tracking the emerging threat last time, and that had, that had to do with data sharing uh, in real time. Have you observed that? Um, definitely since SARS. I was in the SARS epidemic in China, and I spent the whole epidemic in China and Hong Kong. And May I ask, did you just do that because you thought, well, here's an exciting story, or did you happen to be in China when it broke? Oh, no, I went to it. I go to epidemics. I see. So there are <laughs> some people fly into tornadoes. Lori flies into <laughs> epidemics. In, in the case of SARS, definitely the Chinese Central Committee, um, the uh, authorities in Guangdong province, the Guangdong CDC, everybody was in cover-up mode. And there was tremendous mm -hmm. dysfunction within the Communist Party because it happened to occur. The very first human case actually staggered into a hospital the very day the Central Committee met and chose um, Hu Jintao to succeed Zhang Zemin. And so it was, a, it was an actual coincident event. And they knew that selecting Hu Jintao would be controversial. They didn't want any violence. They didn't want anything to rock the boat. So it was, there shall be no disaster or crisis until all the way to April when 
uh, Hu Xintao's appointment would be officially certified by the People's Party Congress. This coincides uh, with flu season. Exactly. And so the SARS lesson um, humiliated China. I mean, when they were caught lying, when it became apparent that they had not controlled it in domestically at all, they basically had to turn the entire country into a massive public health quarantine. And everywhere I went, all over China, you would be stopped every 10 kilometers and get a fever check. And if you had a fever, there's no civil liberties. It's just, we don't care the cause of the fever. You now go to a quarantine center, and you're not released until we're absolutely sure you don't have So the have civil SARS. liberties aspect was fairly horrifying, and we all saw that. But the massive deployment was kind of impressive. And would that ever help in a future epidemic? Well, I mean, China did things that we certainly could never do. I saw them build quarantine, high security um, hospitals, 1,500 bed hospitals, with dedicated sewer systems and air purification and everything in seven days. <sighs> Seven days. Of course, the construction workers were like slave labor. They lived on the site, and and these things just went up. And they did it. They did it first in Beijing, and then they replicated it in every province in the entire nation. Um, but you asked about the cooperation. Mm -hmm. So, SARS humiliated China. They knew they couldn't play that game anymore. That we'd left the era of covering up outbreaks. They finally stopped putting up roadblocks along with Russia and a few other predictable players to creation of new international health regulations. So finally, in, after the SARS epidemic, we got new what's called the IHR, the International Health Regulations. Among the stipulations are all signing nations, which is almost every nation on the planet, must be transparent about outbreaks and must share samples of potential microbes that may be responsible for those outbreaks. So that got, that's been put to the test now in the case of China. And they have indeed been sharing influenza samples pretty quickly. There's some other things where it's not been as great. If it's agricultural product, they're more likely to hold back. But almost every country is like that, including us. So that's really good news. Um, but what about these, you know, none of us wants to sleep tonight. We've slept enough in the past couple of days. So what about the idea of, you know, creating viruses and releasing them because you're mad at somebody? Mm -hmm. You know, is that something that we really should be worried about? Or is it just going to be for your lucrative movie consulting deals? We're getting closer and closer to that all the time. I mean, thanks to synthetic biology revolution, and the extraordinarily uh, rapid decline in all the costs related to sequencing. And um, uh, MakerBot just put out and is selling through Radio Shack not only their 3D printer, but now a 3D scanner. Um, everything is, you know, home utility now. You can, for about $9,000 now, and I'm sure it'll be about 900 in a couple of years, you can buy your own home genome sequencer, stick it in your kitchen. Um, so what do you want to sequence and for what purpose? Uh, you know, I love the iGEM competition. Who here has ever known, heard of iGEM? OK, we got a few synthetic biology literate folks here. iGEM is this competition that was originally created in, I think it's 2005, uh, at MIT. The idea was to put college kids, and later they added high school kids, in competition over who could create uh, novel organisms that self-replicated. Um, and it's now up to, uh, I think last year it was 178 novel organisms were created, mostly by high school kids. So if you don't know how to create, you have to call up your 16-year-old. And the devices, the mechanisms, the costs, everything have come down to rock bottom. So if your average 16-year-old kid who's a, a good science geek can make a microorganism, a novel microorganism with high school equipment, what's to stop? a much more nefarious individual from doing so. Is anything to stop that? And should there be government regulations that we should be supporting? Well, the problem, and this is what I am writing about in the forthcoming uh, Foreign Affairs, so you'll see my detailed recipes for what Two policy weeks. should be. But um, right now, everything to do with the regulation of and, and the safety of all of us in this room is about lists of pathogens 
and tracking key pathogens. But we're now in an era where it's about information. And as you know, in all kinds of other fields, monitoring the flow of cyber information is proving extremely difficult. It's very hard. The, the Dutch actually imposed an export control law on the Dutch researcher who made the novel H5N1 oh, right. virus and said he was violating European Export Control Act by publishing how he did it. Because under the Dutch edict, this would be a cookbook for terrorists. They withdrew that, and then another court in Holland just uh, uh, about 10 days ago said, um, yeah, you violated the export control law. But isn't, so this, isn't this frantically looking through the codexes to find a law that's on the books that absolutely. they can use rather than forward thinking and trying to prevent well, and, the future? Well, and of course, you know, I'm, I, I think the synthetic biology revolution is terribly exciting. And we don't want to stifle it. Mm -hmm. We don't want all the promise of synthetic biology. And frankly, we don't want to stop people from doing uh, barcoding of nature, you know, and getting out there and doing massive genome, genomic sequencing. We need all that as part of our fight to monitor what's going on with climate change and loss of biodiversity. It's, it's essential. Um, so, but government, of course, wants to come up with a clean, obvious, you know, this is what we stop. And the danger is you go too far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there are a variety of ways that we can indeed go into this new era safely, uh, but they involve realizing we've spent several billion dollars in the United States doing the wrong things post 9-11. And we need to change the way we think about the threat of terrorism slash biological weapons. Um, and of course, all of this is gotten to a new alarm level because of Syria and chemical weapons and concern that Syria could, also has bioweapons. How could I have forgotten that? Um, we can thank Lori Garrett very much for being able to talk about anything to do with health. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.